Good day, everybody. My name is Irene Burke. I'm the SAFOS Membership Development Officer, and I'm just going to share with you the house rules. Please note that all opinions and statements are those of the individual making the presentation and not necessarily the opinion or view of SAFOS. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SAFOS website within seven days. Um, for best viewing of the presentation material, please click on Maximize in the upper right corner of the slide window, then Restore to return to normal view. Please turn off other applications that require internet connections to avoid slow transmission and blurry vision. Audio is transmitted over the computer, so please have your speaker or headphones on and volume turned up in order to hear. A telephone connection is not available. Questions should be submitted to the presenter during the presentation using the question section at the right side of the screen. Click on the drop down arrow, type your question and then submit. Questions will be answered at the end of, the present, of every presentation. Um, when typing your questions, please refrain from using acronyms to allow the moderator to easily read them out. Over to you, Sete. Thank you very much, Irene. Good day, everyone. My name is Tata Baloi. I'm the communications officer at SAFOST. I would like to formally welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, it's been a great pleasure contacting all the speakers and getting them to speak to you today in preparation for you guys as students to have a leg up when you go into, into the industry. I'm going to quickly introduce our first speaker. His name is Kobas Brink. He's a group technical manager at Famous Brands. He, need no, he needs no introduction to the Southwest Organizing Committee because we've been working with him over the years and he's been giving excellent presentations to students in preparing them to be good graduates when they go into the food industry. Kobas, I'm handing over formally to you to talk to our students about what it takes for a graduate to succeed in the food industry. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? We can, yes, we can see, Kobas. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. And it's fantastic to be here again. Um, always a great opportunity to be able to talk to um, the students that are entering the uh, the next major phase of their life which is the uh, time to start working um, i'm going to be talking about opportunities in the food industry um, specifically for graduates in um, food science food technology um, even uh, food microbiology so the um First thing I want to show you is uh, just a picture. This is my team. I'm the sore thumb that's sticking out at the right hand side there. Um, this photo was taken about two years ago when we uh, did uh, some uh, food waste recycling and packed food um, for uh, Food Forward. And this was my team. And uh, the thing I want to point out here is there's a lot of faces here that are no longer in my team. And it's people that have gone on to bigger and better things. Lady here, yeah, Rani Hanis, uh, she was uh, my 2IB. She's moved on. She's now a manufacturing executive. Pabalo in the middle here, yeah, um, she uh, used to be uh, in charge of our MPD. And she's moved on. Uh, and she's now actually the product manager for the whole Steers brand. So there's always opportunity to grow in this industry, as long as you keep a few things in mind. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to give you some tips. As you are starting your career, you're going to be dealing with a lot of different people. And it's very important that the first thing you know is that you know actually very little. Um, we have infamous brands before this COVID disaster happened. Uh, we were bringing in on a very regular basis up to 20 interns that spent time in my specific uh, department. And we, uh, as part of the interview process, give them a simple little test and say, uh, ask you some questions uh, and you write a little test. Um, and I ask you um, 
score yourself on a rating from one to ten what you think your food safety knowledge is um, generally people uh, say that their food safety knowledge is a six or a seven and then when you write the test most people get a two or a three so please realize that there is a lot of learning that still needs to be done the second a very important thing is you need to be prepared to learn from anyone and everyone in the organization that you are going to work in and that will be from the cleaner to the ceo a lot of people in a lot of organizations have been there for a very long time and you can learn from everyone so be prepared for that no matter what someone that you come across does always respect the people who are already doing the job that you want to do very very important and you are going to start off doing menial work uh, be prepared for that uh, you may work long hours you might do very repetitive tasks because those things have to be done as as part of the job uh, and this is not a glamorous job guys uh, throw away the bling you're going to be spending your time in gum boots and, and hair nets and, uh, and lab coats. Um, a lot of the foods, people who do this job, who start off, does actually start off in the food safety field. So no jewelry, no makeup, no long nails, um, all those types of things. So uh, please be prepared for cold. If you work in a cold facility, be prepared for heat. If you work in a bakery, it's not a glamorous job. And the next thing is you've got to be thick skinned. People are always in conflict with people who work on the food technology side of things, irrespective of what you do, whether you're in NPD or you are in quality or even in production, uh, people are always going to take you on because you are there to monitor, to control and be prepared to fight and stand up for yourself and be thick skinned. Uh, if you're not, you're not going to last long. So what I'll do next is I will take you guys through some of the types of fields that you will potentially be going into. Um, it's very rare that someone who is a food scientist will actually work as a food scientist. Most people start in the quality role. And uh, there's uh, some of my people once again, the young lady on the right hand side here will be speaking to you guys after I've done. Um, she started off as an intern with me um, and she has moved on to bigger and better things. But we spend a lot of time in front of a computer, a lot of time in the plant. So this is where you'll probably start and that can start as a laboratory technician. Um, in an office uh, or as a quantity controller on a production line um, and remember when we talk about quality from a food point of view we actually mean food safety so you need to make sure that you have a very strong uh, food safety background um, and your knowledge in food safety you need to start working on that right now so very important um, that you understand all the standards and all the regulations that relate to food safety. I would probably estimate that 60 to 70% of graduates do start in this route. So it's very important that if you don't know the standards like the HACCP standard and the PRP standards and the food safety regulations that we have in South Africa, that you start studying those things because it is going to be expected of you to be able to implement these specific things uh, very importantly and that something that people are very a lot of people are very weak on is HACCP uh, the biggest favor you can do yourself before you start looking for a job is to go do a HACCP course so that you can understand what this is about because this is one of the foundational principles in any type of food manufacturing facility and as I said earlier be prepared for long hours, for potentially shift work. And what is critically important is attention to detail. Um, we deal, if you're in the quality side, you deal with 
people's lives. Because if something goes wrong, people can die. We've seen it in this country with the Listeria outbreak that we've had. So attention to detail is absolutely critical. And then please also remember that if you are in the quality role, you are not going to be liked. Uh, production people produce, they want to send product out the door. Whereas um, quality people want to make sure that that product that goes out the door is safe. And sometimes you are going to decide that it's not safe. And then you are going to uh, not be very liked by your production people when you tell them to hold a batch back. So be prepared. So this is normally the first phase that you will start in. Um, some people get lucky and they get the opportunity to go into product development or what we call NPD, new product development. Um, NPD is a lot different from working quality on a line. Quality is slow and meticulous and you do everything by the book. NPD can be an incredibly fast paced environment, depending on who you're going to be working for. The, uh, what's important is it, you need a strong knowledge of how products are put together. So when you're dealing with a source, for instance, you need to know about the thickeners and you need to know about the emulsifiers, how you put a product together. Um, another thing you're going to need is a very solid understanding of formulating for food safety. Um, if you speak to some of the people uh, who've been in food safety for a long time, they say one of the big weaknesses is that people on the NPD side of the business don't formulate for food safety. And this is where concepts like hurdle technology, which you should be familiar with, come in. And very importantly, you need to develop a product that is safe from the start or as safe as possible as you can make it. The um, other thing that you need in NPD is good people skills. Um, good people skills are very important for the very simple reason that you are going to be dealing with probably more the marketing side of the, of the business. You're going to be making products for them, developing products for them. But you also need to deal with the production people who must put your product together. So having good people skills is very important in MPD. MPD is a very exciting field. It's fun, uh, but sometimes it can also really stress you out because you might have to try and try and try again. We're currently busy with a product that we're developing and we are basically on trial number 16. So sometimes it works the first time, sometimes it's going to take a long time, but it is a fun and interesting uh, job to be in. You can also decide to go into production. You know, it is rare to start here because you do need experience, but you know, Rani, uh, who was in my team, is a perfect example of someone who took her food safety skills and knowledge and her food technology skills and knowledge and she is now a manufacturing executive she runs a plant for us so don't think you're going to go directly into production um, because you also need a very strong knowledge of production systems and equipment the benefit of working from the quality side first is that it does give you the opportunity to get into factories and to spend time in factories and to understand how everything works. You know, um, once again in production, long hours, shift work, a lot of attention to detail because you want to make sure that every product you produce come out the way you want to. Um, if you're on the production side, this tends to clash with quality. So also be prepared uh, to defend your position and always we defend the position from a position of knowledge. Um, the one thing I do want to say is that food safety people, in my opinion, make fantastic production managers and production executives because you come from a culture of making safe product and it does make things a lot easier to do. So that is the th sort of the three fields that you can go into. Um, as a food scientist or food technologist in real life, uh, working for food manufacturers. And not all of you 
are going to get there. Um, it's not a field that has got millions of open positions. Um, so think that they, they don't think and don't become despondent if you get rejected for your first or your second or your third um, job application. And if you can get into an intern program, that's a fantastic place to start. But there are other opportunities. Um, and some of those opportunities can be very rewarding and very interesting. So the first opportunity I want to talk to you about is the cleaning and hygiene industry. Um, in cleaning and hygiene, the, um, a lot of companies manufacture cleaning and hygiene products for the food industry. And that can be a very interesting field. It once again gives you the opportunity to get into facilities and understand how things work. So this is an opportunity because a lot of companies um, require food technologists to sell their products for them. Um, food franchising opportunities, something like a franchise manager for an organization like Famous Brands. Um, you know, we've got over two and a half thousand restaurants and all those restaurants are being taken care of by franchise managers that need to have a strong understanding of food and the handling of food um, and the things that can go wrong. So that is another opportunity. Um, sales can be a very big opportunity. I started off in the, in the food industry as a salesman. It's very rewarding. You can make very nice uh, money and you sell food ingredients. You must remember that every food manufacturer in the country use food ingredients and these food ingredients are generally bought from companies that are either specialists in food or have food and non-food divisions. Um, and once again, this gives you the opportunity to learn a lot for the very simple reason that um, the uh, food companies that, for instance, sell emulsifiers or they sell thickeners or flavor houses, they need to have a very good understanding of their product. And they do put a lot of effort into training their salespeople on how to use the product. Then lastly, there is also always the hospitality industry. Um, the hospitality industry also needs skilled food technologists, food scientists, uh, and whether this is from a menu development point of view or from a food safety point of view, uh, there is also opportunity there. So if that first application that you put into work as a food technologist doesn't come right, then remember there are other opportunities. Something that's very, very important in this industry is to build a network. With a strong network, you will find out about positions that are available. So use platforms like LinkedIn, uh, put your CV, no matter how bare it might be at this stage together, and then um, put it out there, connect with people in the food industry. Um, you know, I've got over two and a half thousand connections on LinkedIn and it works both ways. You find out about jobs that may be available or if you need an answer, it's very nice to have a long list of people that you can ask. Then once you are settled in, and it is something that a lot of people, uh, food technologists look at, is auditing. Um, auditing is a very rewarding job where you become a food safety auditor. The money is good, the hours are long, but it's interesting because you get to know a wide range of industries. Please just remember that to become an auditor, you need solid experience. And with solid experience, I mean at least five years in the food industry working with manufacturing of food. But this can be a very, very lucrative and rewarding career. I was a food safety auditor for nearly 15 years. Um, and um, I learned so much during that time for the very simple reason that you are spending time in every different food facility that's out there. And you learn and you've got to keep on learning. That is critical. If you guys look at behind me, uh, you'll see a bookshelf. That bookshelf is full of books only about food, food manufacturing, microbiology, all that types of things. 
So um, I have reached the end of my presentation. I want to wish you all the best of luck. Um, look me up on LinkedIn if you want to. You're more than welcome. Um, and uh, good luck and have fun. Remember, you've decided to pick this career. Make sure that you enjoy it, that you have fun and always learn. The day you stop learning is the day that you start dying. And that's it from my side. Thank you, Corbis. Um, I've got one or two questions. Um, the HACCP courses that you say students, um, it's a good thing to do. Is there short courses or is it available? Where would they go to find out? Yeah, um, we have got quite a few. Uh, most of the good training is done by our certification bodies. Um, and if you just Google a HACCP course and it's uh, from someone like Intertech or SGS or Bureau Veritas, they are three big certification bodies in South Africa. Um, there are also uh, organizations like BioMoreau or SWIFT um, that offer these courses. What's important when you pick a course, especially HACCP, you want to do an introductory course. That's normally a, a one-day course or a two-day course. And then once you've completed that, you want to move on to what we call the advanced HACCP course. And that is a normally a four or a five-day course that really delves into how to implement HACCP. Um, what's very important when you, tick a, uh, when you pick a training provider, just make sure that they are accredited in some sort of way. But that's the easiest. You start with the introduction, and then from there, you move on to the advanced asset. Have you got an idea what it more or less costs? Because that's the other thing is um, one in the... It's not, it's not harshly expensive. Uh, I did mine about 25 years ago. So uh, using that as a price benchmark, I wouldn't. But the introductory course is probably in the range of 1,000 to 2,000 Rand. And the advanced course probably in the range of six to seven thousand rand, um, okay. but I could be out by a thousand on the high side. So uh, it could be it could be cheaper. It's important to shop around, but you also want to pick the right presenter. You know, um, being a teacher is not an easy job. Um, so you always want to ask questions like, who's presenting the course? Can I see the CV of the person who's presenting the course? But there are some really good trainers out there. Thank you for that. So next question, how does one deal with jobs requiring many years of experience when you do not have experience? It can be very discouraging, but at the same time, how does one get the point of not selling himself short? <laughs> The yeah, that is, a, that is a tricky, very tricky question. And um, what is important is to realize where you are. Don't apply for a job that you know they're going to turn you down. If they say we need so much experience, don't apply because it's just going to make you despondent. Shop around, uh, look for intern programs. You know, uh, for instance, our famous brands program has been very successful. And as soon as COVID is over, we're probably going to reinstate that. Um, and then when you apply for a job, be honest. Um, say to people, I know I'm going to start at the top, pre, uh, at the bottom. Prio is going to talk to you guys just now, is a perfect example of someone who is totally committed, who came into the intern program, who worked her butt off um, for very little money and um, she's flying in our organization now and I'm so proud of her. So be prepared to start at the bottom. You know, Say to people, just give me a chance. I know I know nothing, but I want to learn. But don't apply for jobs that's above your pay grade because then you're just going to get despondent when you get turned down. Thank you. Um, and then it's a, a tricky one as well is the consumer science students majoring in food science and nutrition there's always an overlap and they ask um are they able and qualify for these qualify for these jobs because i know there's an overlap always on like product development with with them i think it's i think it's important that people need to understand what a degree means 
A degree does not mean for a second that you are an expert in anything. A degree tells me that you have the ability to learn. Um, it's important that since you are probably going to move into the food safety and quality side, that you rather spend time and effort in understanding those standards. Um, but if you start from the bottom and you are willing to learn, and you've got to be willing to learn, you want to understand those standards. So if you did consumer science and you're not strong on a food safety, uh, on the food safety side of things, go do the courses, make yourself better equipped for the job. And then I see no reason why you cannot do the job. Um, I don't look at people's qualifications. I, we do require people to have a degree um, purely because that tells me that you have the ability to learn. And then everyone who comes into our organization start at the bottom uh, and we teach them. You know, that's important. Uh, if, you do, if you walk into a job where they know you know nothing and the company doesn't want to put effort in to develop you, then you leave. It's as simple as that. But yes, consumer science can go into food safety as long as you do the extra work and you study and learn and understand the standards and how they work. Okay, one more question. Um, out of all of the jobs you mentioned, which one would you say is the best and flexible to do? I don't know if there is flexible in food science. Um, yeah, uh, flexible, um, uh, I would really love to know what that person who asked the question means by flexible. Um, all these jobs in the food industry um, depends on who you work for. If you work for famous brands, we've got 10 manufacturing facilities. You learn a lot. Um, but the bottom line is uh, there's very little flexibility. We work with food standards. We work within a very rigid framework of what may or may not be done. Um, you know, uh, if, if you mean by flexible, flexible working hours, um, as long as the job gets done. But um, food safety is tends to be fairly rigid, um, but it can be a lot of fun too. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Corvus. I think that um, we must move on because we've got quite a tough, um, schedule. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, over to you, Tete. Thank you very much, Irene. And thank you, Corvus, for that wonderful presentation. Guys, uh, what we can take from this is what do you need to survive in the industry? What's the requirement of you as a young person going into the field that's new? Yes, we're going to graduate in flying colors, but we need to be work ready. So I took the liberty of finding somebody who's a peer so that they can speak to you in the language and level of understanding that you're in. So I'm introducing to you Priyanka Naidu. She is the TQFSM manager, bakery at Famous Brands. She's young, she's ambitious, and she has quite a passionate, she's quite a passionate person about the food industry. And she's going to talk to you about insight into the food industry and what you need to know as a student. Over to you, Priyanka. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to everyone at SAFOS as well as um, Kobus. Okay, so today um, I'll just be talking to you, giving you some insight as to how things unfold in the food industry um, as you enter, as you grow, and as you develop. So I'll be sharing with you some insights um, as to what is available, what the expectations versus reality actually is, and as well as some tips and tricks. So just a quick background on me and how I started, because I'm sure everyone is quite intrigued as to how do you actually start this journey in the industry. So I completed a degree, a degree and honors um, in microbiology at UKZN. I then went into a research institution called um, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research um, as an intern. Um, and I was more or less based in the biomanufacturing industry which in essence is manufacturing bacteria on a large scale. So for me, as much as it was interesting, I felt I was just not suited to the research industry because I wasn't really um, intrigued in pursuing further studies like a master's or PhD um, in microbiology in particular. So I felt like I just wanted a bit more in my career. 
So then moving on, expanding my horizons, I then joined the famous Brands family in 2019 um, as an intern, like Kobus mentioned. Um, and I've grown leaps and bounds since then. I was retained as a permanent uh, staff member in 20, um, 20, 2019, sorry, um, as the group quality and food safety coordinator working directly under Kobus. And then last year, October, I was um, quite fortunate to be promoted to my current role which is a quality and food safety manager for the bakery plant. So with little to no food safety or food science exposure in my studies, um, I'd just like to highlight to you guys that by having the right mentors, the right tools and the right training, I was able to start a fruitful journey in the food industry. And the first and most important consideration you all should be aware of is like Kobus mentioned, keep the right company. Those who can grow you, those you can learn from, as well as to work hard and empower yourself with knowledge, because those are the key determining factors in your success in whichever field you wish to explore, whether it's in food science or not. So when you're entering the food industry, um, there's various avenues um, in which you can explore as graduates, depending on what piques your interest as an individual. So I'll just touch on a few briefly. Firstly, um, the new product development and the product improvement environment, where you focus more on innovating um, and improving products as well as um, running projects. So this is more, I think, for a creative individual who, like Kobus mentioned, can work at a fast pace and has good people and interactive uh, skills. The second is the laboratory testing and verification environment where if you feel you're more suited to routine testing and you're good at it and you don't mind doing um, the repetitive kind of work, I think this is what you will be more suited to um, working in. The third is the technical advisory aspect, which usually comes after a few years of experience in the food industry. The option of working on the floor or at manufacturing facilities directly involved with food safety and quality of products going out to consumers. So this is currently the field that I am in, which is number four. Um, and I just like to speak a bit about it. So it's a very dynamic environment. Um, you need to be prepared to be, um, like always meant, it's not, it's not a glamorous role. You need to be prepared to work long hours, as well as to be agile in everything that you do. And then the last um, sector would be the auditing, consulting, and training. So with regards to this sector, you would require a few years of good experience, as well as to have established yourself in the industry um, in order to succeed here. I think uh, this will basically only happen after a few years in the previous roles mentioned, mentioned from one to four. So there are several factors that will determine what you're interested in and what you will be successful in. For example, your work ethic, your personality, your interest, as well as your future plan for yourself. So it's very important that you speak to individuals in all of these roles to ascertain what you can identify with and what you would like to explore. I was very fortunate uh, personally to have joined a company like Famous Brands that has all of these role players um, in it. So for me, gathering information um, and figuring out my place was quite simple because I had the right people around me and um, that were advising me. So, Essentially, by gathering this information from your colleagues very early on in your working career, you will much easier know your direction in the food industry. Thus far for me, I have thoroughly enjoyed working in the food industry. I've had exposure to many of these roles listed here and in many different manufacturing facilities. And trust me, it never gets boring. Um, every day there are new challenges. You're constantly learning. You're constantly improving. And you know, as much as it can be daunting, because there is a huge sense of responsibility on you when you work in the food industry. I mean, every single day when we send vans out here at the bakery, there's hundreds of people's, of life, people's lives that are at risk. So remember the responsibility of consumers is basically in your hands. So basically handling food products always forces you to be on top of your game, which is never actually a bad thing. So what exactly um, is it like working in the food industry? So when I joined Famous Brands, I was almost a new graduate. I'd just been working a year in, in my previous position as an intern as well. And I must say, it took, it did take some adjustments. It's really not like university days where you're at leisure. I think there needs to be a mindset change to get you in here. 
it's an extremely dynamic environment which is risk-based so something that is very important is being able to apply yourself i think what's also essential like Kobus mentioned is also knowing that book knowledge doesn't really hold that much in the industry what you need to be able to do more for you need to be more skilled at applying what you have learned to what you're physically doing so it's more an application of knowledge as opposed to just being knowledgeable. And I think this is what many graduates and me personally, I struggle to do at the beginning. Often we come into the industry um, thinking that qualifications hold everything, but work is a completely different experience and that needs to be understood. You need to enter the food industry with a determined attitude. You need to be prepared to be dedicated as well as to persevere in everything you set out to do. Um, as menial as the task is. An important thing to remember uh, in food safety and quality in particular is that we work with documents. So being meticulous, being orderly, being structured is absolutely essential. But on the flip side of things, we also work with people. So having people skills, having the ability to transfer valuable knowledge is just as important. And striking the right balance with this is absolutely essential. Having a food science background, being knowledgeable about standards is always advantageous as you'll always know what the expectations is, what the requirements are, as well as what you're gonna be expected to implement, which is so, so important. It forms the basis of your success in this career. Also remember, you will not come into the industry embodying all these traits listed here today. Um, but the most essential thing to take away is to ensure that you come into the workplace with the right attitude because once you pick up these traits very quickly, um, you will surely see your path to success paving its way in front of you. So in terms of expectation versus reality, being a graduate in the working environment can be an extremely huge challenge and a huge adjustment, especially being young and coming out of university, you're very energetic, there's a certain level of excitement, there's eagerness. Um, so entering as an intern will give you more time to grasp and to learn while you are still shadowing a senior um, as opposed to entering um, your, your first job in a full full time role you know um, that may be more challenging because the accountability lays with you from the start compared to entering as an intern where you're given the opportunity to grow and to learn um, for a particular period of time so a few other things to remember um, when you are considering entering the industry is being flexible is absolutely essential meaning that if you get assigned several tasks you need to be able to do it all at once you can't just be very close-minded in what you're doing at any point in time working speedily to get things done right it's a very very busy environment so we need to be quick we need to be agile being able to multitask as i earlier mentioned being able to apply yourself empowering yourself with knowledge, constantly reading up, constantly um, following different food um, focus pages where you're able to get whatever new information is currently um, happening in the food safety and food science environment, as well as being able to problem solve are key traits that you may not think you need in an entry level position, but trust me, these are all very important traits that will basically kickstart your career. When you, do embody these traits it'll definitely give you an advantage in the work environment and i think your aim at the start should be to execute every single task assigned to you no matter how little or how big to the best of your ability to shine and to be noticed is absolutely important and i think if you start your work ethic the correct way from the start you're guaranteed to be paving a successful path ahead of you so now that i've been through some of my experiences, where do you guys start? So setting up or constantly updating your LinkedIn profiles is essential. This is basically your accessible TV to the network. So keep it concise, keep it professional and keep the general banter to your social media accounts. LinkedIn should remain as professional as possible. Once you've set up your profile on LinkedIn, do some reading up. Um, this is very, very important. Um, so do some reading up on the companies of interest, follow various companies, follow different food focus sites, different internship sites, just to keep in the loop of what's going on as well as um, regarding vacancies. 
also on other recruitment sites. I think keep a lookout for internship programs throughout the year. It's a great start. And although you may feel deterred by the role or the, the actual um, remuneration, always remember that getting your foot in the door is the first step. And then lastly, update and ensure your CV is concise and relevant and apply. The more applications you send out, the greater your chances of getting an opportunity. The, as graduates entering first-time job opportunities, there will be times, no doubt, um, and I felt this myself, where you feel lost, where you feel anxious or like you're in the deep end, but always give it your best and persevere. And always remember, to be successful in the work environment, attitude is equally important as ability. So thank you so much for your time and good luck to each and every one of you on your onward journey. Thank you so much. And I think you've covered everything. There is nothing that you left out. I've got one question so far. Um, so since you have a qualification on microbiology, have you ever considered um, doing your MSc, for example, in food science? And, I, and that sounds as if you've got a very busy program. So yeah, but that was a question. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe here. I think it is a very interesting question because when I was studying my honors even, I never, I always knew at that point I was not going to do my master's and PhD in microbiology. So pursuing it in food science or perhaps in operations management um, is really going to, I think, move me to the next part of my career. I think um, it's very important. And once you get into the food industry and to, into the working world, you realize that learning um, in a vertical manner is just, it just doesn't work. You need to kind of expand your expand horizontally and try and get your fingers into as many things as possible you know um it, you don't even like working as a quality manager i don't just focus on quality i try and pick up things from the plant manager the production manager because it's only by exploring that you actually see what is for you so yeah i mean considering me doing my master's or phd i definitely wouldn't do it in micro but food science or operations or production definitely a route that i would go then, thank you for that. Um, then there's another question is the students want to know when is the right time to start applying for jobs? Is it in the um, third year or at the end or say six months before they finish? Um, when did you start looking for a job? Okay, so it's a little bit of a tough question. I think if you're finishing your degree and you're not at a technical end, um, degree-wise, I think you'd probably have to look towards the last six months of your degree. But I know with a technical end, you have to have a year's experience um, in service. So it's just going to depend on the nature of your degree. But I would say in the last six months before you're actually going to be looking um, at leaving university and starting the job is good. But obviously, this is dependent on various factors, you know, like in times of COVID. Um, it is a little bit more difficult and challenging. So it's, there's no guaranteed set time, but I think a six month uh, pro, um, time lapse should should get you something, you know? But I, like in, for the graduates now, I mean, continuously keep your eye on like sites like Student Village um, and other recruitment sites, because I'm sure that internship programs will be starting again next year. I mean, with the vaccinations being rolled out um, for our age groups, I think that we are looking in a more positive direction. So I think uh, keeping your eye out right now going forward is very, very important. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's no more questions. Um, back to you, Titi. Thank you very much, Irene. And thank you, Priyanka, for the lovely talk that you gave. I think you gave students the more detailed information into what do they need to know when they go to the new job what they need to do as students that are approaching towards the end of their careers in, in the academic sector and trying to get into the job sector. Uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is a young professional new to the industry as well. She is a member of the MISA First Committee. She's exciting to work with. I work with her with regard to MISA First activities. She's a culinary and snacks technologist at Daily Spices. Her name is Emma Johnson. Emma, over to you. 
Perfect, and thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to be online today, and a huge thank you um, for inviting me to speak at this year's Career Roadshow. So today I'm going to be talking about everything SAFOS. What are the benefits of joining our professional association and the volunteership opportunities out there? And really how volunteership has helped me in the early years of my career. So I'd like to rewind back to the days when I was a student um, and I was approaching the end of my undergraduate career and I started looking at job applications. And a light bulb went off for me and I realized that as I would leave university, I would no longer be sheltered by the structure of university and have the access to the wonderful support system of my lecturers, my tutors and classmates. So I was about to enter the real world and I realized that I would need to start my professional development journey. And the first thing was to get a job and secondly, to really start building my CV. So I started to ask myself, how can I get involved in our industry and how can I start meeting people within my industry and begin growing that professional network? So say my screen isn't moving. Um, can you see a screen change? No, no, it's, it's not, it hasn't changed. Okay. Yeah, now it's changing. Okay, wonderful. So I, I was interested to start uh, building my professional network and that I, I soon learned that joining a professional association was a great place to start. And for me, that was SAFOS. So before I go into how I got involved in SAFOS, let me share a little bit more about the sub-association, my SAFOS, and really what it is all about. So my SAFOS is the student and young professional chapter of the South African Association for Food Scientists and Technologists. We're a diverse, passionate group of individuals within academia and industry who are learning to navigate the world of food science and technology together. And by instilling a culture of I learn, I lead, I mentor, we hope to equip and enable one another to become well-rounded and knowledgeable young food scientists. We also aim to ensure the longevity of our association and in doing so become the future generation of the South African food industry. So as a member, how will you benefit? You will have opportunities to build your network, to make friends. You will receive invites to national and regional events. You will have access to the FST magazine, as well as the student job listing portal on the SAFOS website. You will have the ability to give back to your industry. When we return to face-to-face -face events, you will be able to attend social events, which will help you with your networking. For those of you who are interested in volunteership, you will have the opportunity to join my SAFOS committee and through these exercise your leadership skills. So as I mentioned, as a my SAFOS member, you have the opportunity to volunteer on a mass SAFOS committee. Mostly volunteership as a means to give back to your community, which is incredibly rewarding. And others see, as, see it as an opportunity to meet people and to include it on your CV. So I volunteered for SAFOS since 2016, and I'd really like to share my story with you. So after graduating from Stellenbosch University, I reached out to one of my lecturers, Prof Gunnar Sigar, and asked, how I could get more involved in the association. At the time, the Cape Branch was planning the 2017 Congress and Gunnar invited me to sit in on a meeting. I thoroughly enjoyed the first meeting and asked if I could sit in on the subsequent meeting. I was curious to learn more. A few months later, at the Cape Branch BGM, I was elected as a Cape Branch committee member. Many events followed. We organized the Cape Branch cook-off, a group of us got my SAFOS onto its feet. I was then elected vice chair of the Cape Branch, and as a default, I sat on the National SAFOS Council. I've had the pleasure of working with Tricia Fitchett at FST, and I've attended SAFOS Congresses, 
as well as IFT congresses and mass Afos workshops. More recently, I've attended the IFT Emerging Leaders Conference and have met many food young professionals from around the world and learnt about their stories and learnings in their countries. During my time volunteering for SAFAS, I have been able to meet many new people at all stages of their careers, both in industry and academia. On a more abstract note, my experience at Council has allowed me to observe our staff of leaders run meetings and address association affairs. Through my interaction with these individuals, I have been fortunate enough to receive some great mentorship along the way. So here's my volunteership story. What have I learned? What have I gained? In the five to six years that I've been volunteering for staff ask, I've built a network. I've been able to exercise my teamwork skills. I've made lots of friends. I've received mentorship. I've navigated challenges. As I mentioned, I've had exposure to senior staff of leadership. I've practiced my listening and public speaking skills. I've said the right things and I've said the wrong things and learned how to apologize for these. I've learned how to ask for sponsorship. I've attended congresses. And all in all, I've learned a pretty load about food science. So if I reflect on, on what I've learned and where I've come. So as a student, I was quite a diligent, conscientious, conscientious student. I, I loved my studies, but I was incredibly self-critical. I was task-driven. I preferred working in smaller groups as I found this easier, as there was less dynamics involved. I was someone who really battled to speak up and ask for help. And to be honest, I didn't like to fail. As I entered industry, I viewed the technical expertise and know-how as the main contributor to a successful food career. But oh boy, was I wrong. So what have I learned? I love working in large teams. I love people. I have started to build my self-awareness. I'm more relationship driven. I'm candid to myself when things don't go according to plan. And I'm comfortable to make mistakes in front of others and I've gained some humor along the way. I have learned that authenticity is everything. It's cool to stand up for what you believe in. People like people who are human and not robots. As I mentioned, technical know-how is not everything. Companies view emotional intelligence, as a, emotional intelligence as a huge plus point. I have also gained some perspective. In STEM, experience may mean wisdom, but it doesn't necessarily equal capability. Being young in corporate is cool. And most importantly, that my age is not my weakness, but rather my secret weapon. These learnings have all come through my volunteership experience at SAFOS. Meeting other food professionals and academics has made me all that more passionate about my career and curious about what's still out there. It has added a different dimension to my early working years. And through it all, I've had so much fun and I've made many friends along the way. As Prof Sigal once said, what you put in is what you get out. And that volunteering is for everyone. You just need a little curiosity about what's out there. You need to be determined and you can't be scared to ask questions. So for those of you who are interested to join a My Staffos Working Group, you're welcome to send your name and region to Sharon to find out more. For those of you who aren't really interested to join a committee, but want to understand more about what My Staffos does, please direct your queries to setsafos.org.za and do follow us on social media. There are a lot of exciting activities on the go, especially those in the lead up to Congress, and I encourage you to get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, I can just come in there and on the membership, as, as you've heard from Emma, how important it is to network and to get to know people and the industry. And by becoming or being a SAFOS member, it's very important to be active. It doesn't really help to be a member and you do nothing and because you're not 
in reaching your knowledge and you're also not meeting the right people. So I urge you to stay a member of SAFOST and I know the student membership is for free, but after you finish your studies, please stay involved. And, and as you've heard from um, uh, Emma, how important it, it, it is for her, was for her career. I've got a question here. It says, how much do you pay to join? Um, when you become a full member of SAFOS, it's um, then you're a professional or a member. It's 765 Rand per year. For student doing your first four years is for free. And if you, you study further for your M or your D, you become a postgrad member and that is 265 Rand per year. So it's, it's, it's really worth it. And I urge you to stay a member to keep your foot in the door and to be able to network. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, over to you, Tete. Thank you so much, Irene, and thank you, Emma, for your wonderful presentation. I think students need to know that when you volunteer, the message that you're sending to your future employer is that you have the ability to take initiative. You have the drive and the need and the want to do something with your life, and you want to contribute your time and energy to something more meaningful. So as we spoke about what it takes for you to graduate, to, to, to succeed as a graduate in the industry, we've given you insight into the food industry, and we've spoken about what volunteering can do for your professional career. We're going to talk about one big important thing, which is a CV. This is the one document that can get your foot in the door. So it needs to be written in a way that it attracts your future employer. We know that at this time, you do not have that much experience. We do not have that much insight into the industry, but you need to, you're going to put your faith in one document so that it lends you that interview. And who better to give that presentation than Marianne Duplessis? She's a HR practitioner at Par Excellence, and she's done extensive recruiting recruitment for most companies in the food industry. So she's just giving, going to give you insight into CV writing and what are the best practices. Mariana, over to you. Hi, Mariana. Mariana, please remember to unmute yourself. You're still on mute.
You are muted to see okay. that. Okay. And now? Okay, I'll talk to Siti. Okay, no way. Hello, Siti. Can you hear me? Siti? Mariano, we can hear Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Just open your presentation and then you can start. Okay. Open my presentation. Wait a second. Okay. Now where am I now? Yeah, how do I get this away? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Elias, is it now? Um, good afternoon. This is Mariana Way Duplessis. I'm a guidance and industrial psychologist and a personnel practitioner, training recruitment and selection. And I've been working for the food, beverage, and packaging and agricultural industry for the last 40 years. I was asked to do uh, prepare a curriculum uh, to talk about preparing a curriculum vitae and I added to present yourself in your absence. Uh, I will put this presentation on my on my Facebook page so we can you must later just make sure that you've got the link. A resume versus a curriculum vitae. You normally send a curriculum vitae or a resume to a company to make them aware of your existence and what you can do for them. A resume is one page summary of your work experience and background. It is sent as an appetizer to a company who might have positions in your field in future to market yourself. Should the company indicate an interest in you, you could send them a detailed curriculum vitae. A curriculum vitae is a longer academic diary which includes all your personal details, qualifications, certificates, research experience and publications. It's normally sent with a company of when the company has a position available and they have invited you to send you your CV. It is advisable that you only send your documentation when asked for it or um, Uh, when you email your CV to a company for a possible position, the way you present your CV could make or break your application. It does not help to say that you will tell it all in the interview because you might not be invited to an interview. Your CV should be able to speak to the representatives of the company, open doors for you and ensure that you are invited to an interview. They must be so impressed with you that they offer you another position if you are not suitable for the position you applied for. A golden rule in preparing a CV is that you always have to write the truth. Please do not copy your friend's CV. A CV is very personal, like fingerprints. If you are caught out, you can wave your possible position goodbye. Be humble. I've seen covering letters in which a novice was telling the company representative how he can pull the company together and lift it to new heights. It is good to dream big, but please be realist realistic and don't make a fool of yourself. Please project a smart and well-educated image. If you have to have a covering page for your CV, keep it as simple as possible. You could use a medium-sized photo of yourself. You must remember applying for a position is not just about yourself. There could be up to 100 plus suitable applicants applying. If human resources have a good photo to build your details around, you have a much better chance to leave a lasting impression and to be remembered. Please attach 
a smiling professional head and shoulder photo of yourself. It is much better than a full length photo in which they cannot see your face. Ensure you are dressed as if you are personally attending the interview. Ladies, please not use the party photo, show too much flesh or overdo your makeup. You are not applying for a position as a model. Now, personal details, surname, as per your ID, ladies must also give their maiden name like Nia Beloy. Give your previous surname if you have changed it. Name, as per your ID, add your nickname in inverted commas. Date of birth, rather use your date of birth to identify yourself as per the Poppy Act. Nationality, South African or Zimbabwean, and then if you have got permanent residency, you can attach, uh, uh, also put that in. Gender, male or female, BEE -E status, EE -E or AA, or you can just put in your race. Address, temporary and permanent address, like that of your parent. Telephone numbers, mobile, work, personal, other. Email, also the same. Marital status, please put in uh, what type of uh, marriage you have. And then please put in if you divorce, don't say single. Uh, dependents, your own children and maybe adopted children and their ages, language, the languages that you speak. Uh, put in if you are disabled, it has got its advantages, like in this case, maybe in a wheelchair. Computer literacy, your driver's licenses that you have, your transport, maybe your own or something that you have on loan, Available, availability, maybe immediately or once you complete your studies, location, maybe Gauteng only, prepare to go anywhere, only KwaZulu-Natal or Western Cape, work, uh, work shifts, no, you only have public transport, you use public transport, and yes, uh, it's no problem, you can work shifts. Now, preparing a curriculum vita, you also have, obviously, you have to put in all your, edu your education, high school, university, short courses that you have done. Uh, you know what is the difference between matric and grade 12. Mention all your subjects done, mark distinctions with an asterisk. Sometimes you do uh, subjects outside school add them in as well they've got they are in three but that will also uh, add to your metric qualifications university um, if you have subjects outstanding for your qualification put part bsc food science and uh, then you ha also have to say subjects that are still outstanding and then uh, the ones that you're going to do this year and maybe the ones that are outstanding for next year. Now, courses enrolled for, show your knowledge of current tendencies, uh, conferences attended, shows involvement in industry, achievement shows involvement and dedicated in other dedication in other areas like culture, academics, leadership, sport, professional membership certificates, professional registrations, and the publications, uh, your research that was public, uh, publicized in whatever uh, journal. Uh, that is when you do your research for maybe a master's or a PhD. Um, <clears throat> now, if you do your CV, your experience, please remember companies are very product sensitive. They want to see what product ranges you've worked on. They prefer applicants who have experience on their product ranges. Then they do not have to train them and they bring a wealth of knowledge with them. Please prepare details of your practicals, projects, thesis, and experience, giving hands-on details of the raw 
raw materials, packaging materials and sizes and intermediate and final products you have worked on. If you have worked in a laboratory, please give details of the above, plus details of microbiological, chemical, biochemical and physical tests performed and instrumentation and techniques used. If you did QC or production in a plant, give details of the materials worked on as well as processing and packaging equipment and processes involved. If you were doing R&D, state if it was new product development, product improvement or line extensions. Full details of recipe, product formulations, process and packaging development are also important. When doing sales, please give details of products sold, geographical areas covered and type of clients sold too. Um, your practicals, um, unless you've done your in-service training, uh, very often practicals that you have done are almost the only true experience that you have to brag about. Uh, please put uh, the, de the details of the practicals that you've done, say, for microbiology or chemistry or biochemistry or food science itself. Uh, put in the details of the product ranges that you have tested, um, the testing, the test done, etc. Now, when you have done your practicals in the pilot plant at university, it's very important that we, you give us that detail as well. Give us details of the pilot plant equipment that you've worked on, things like sensory tests that you have done, and maybe the different projects that you have, uh, the different products that you have made, like fruit and vegetables, dairy, sugar confectioning, meat, etc. Uh, projects and thesis, please give us a half a page um, summary of the projects or the thesis that you've done, say for your national diploma in food technology, your BTEC or B BSc food science and uh, the research that you've done for your MSc in food science. Uh, remember, this is your this is your way to demonstrate that you already have done research work. Uh, put in all the products and the packaging materials, etc. Now, if you have worked during holidays or while you were still at school, please put all that in. At least demonstrate that you. Um, know about work that you've got de developed some work ethics um, please put in the months that you've worked there don't just say 216 to uh, 2016 to 2018 put in february and october uh, where you don't just say you worked as a casual baker say what products you've produced what type of raw materials you've used um, your equipment, etc. Now, if you have uh, done practical, worked as a practical assistant at university, put that in as well. Uh, there you have, would have uh, as assisted students in uh, doing their practicals on the pilot plant, put that in as well. If you have done any um, your ex, if you've already completed your in-service training, please put that in. Uh, it is important that you give a definition of each company that you've worked for and what product ranges they have worked, you've worked on. You the, Please don't leave it open and the companies must guess what products you've worked on. Tell us in which department you've worked, the equipment that you've worked on, how long you've worked in each department. If you have done, if you've had exposure to systems like FSSC, etc., please put it in and tell us whether it was uh, implementation or auditing or documentation control or whether you trained staff or whether you were involved in continuous improvement. Whatever you have done, please put that in as well. And don't just give us that. We need all the other information as well. Um, referees, um, 
Keep a list of your referees. Ensure that you ask them if you may use them as referees so that they are prepared uh, and they can tell you, they can tell the uh, companies about you. Please keep in contact with your referees to ensure that you always have their telephone numbers and email addresses. These last 18 months, you've seen how it, easy it is to lose a referee. Always ask for a testimonial from school, university, work, or religious institutions before you or your referee leaves. When giving referees, always ensure that you give full details, their titles, names, surnames, company where you work together, their positions at the time, telephone numbers and email addresses. Use your, their personal contact details. That way you can always get hold of them, even if they have changed companies. A prospective employer could call somebody he knows who worked with you. Always be professional uh, because it might reflect later on in your career. Documentation required. Ensure that you keep these documents in a safe place for when a company asks for it. Have it certified as a true copy of the regional by a commission of oaths. The police does that. You will need these documents until you retire, so please do not throw it away. Official, your ID, maybe your marriage certificate, that is for medical aid or something like that, driver's license, passport, work permit, police police clearance certificate, COVID-19 vaccination certificate, your qualifications, school leaving certificate, all work-related certificates, diploma, result sheets, trade test, SACWA evaluation, your photo, your last facelift, personality test if you had it done, and then testimonials testifying to your skills, capabilities, personality and performance, maybe from school work in the religious organizations. It doesn't help to just say he worked here. It is important that they actually give us details of your performance and maybe what you have done for them and how long you were there. <clears throat> now, uh, you can either send your CV or, or your referee to companies or you can uh, deal via um, recruitment consultants. Um, Recruitment consultants depend on the commission they earn when placing applicants successfully. Please let them know when the company offers you the position. Uh, should a recruitment consultant off approach you with the position, please tell them if you have previously applied for a similar or the same position. If not, give him or her the go-ahead to represent you. If another consultant contact you afterwards, tell them that your application has been submitted. Please do not approach the company yourself. If more than one person or consultant apply, the company will reject your application to prevent unpleasantness. If you stay with one recruitment consultant, he or she gets to know you, have or check your references in the past, should have all your documents and should have a reasonable curriculum vita of you on record. Please do not be selective when preparing your curriculum vita. Put all your qualifications and experience in. Otherwise, you have to redo your curriculum vita every time you play for an, apply for another position. Well, thank you very much. I hope you have, have, have a happy job hunting. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, I don't think it can be any more complete than what you've shared with them, them today. And I see you've got your details um, on, the, on the screen there. And um, please contact Mariana. She's been in the, as you've heard, in the food industry. And um, I've, I've referred a lot of people to Mariana's website as well. And you can visit her website um, to get all this detail to prepare your CV. And um, you can also um, listen afterwards to this presentation again uh, because it will go onto our website. Thank you so much, Mariana. Over to Tete. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you so much, Irene. And thank you all for being here today. I'm going to give you the last presentation.
Uh, it's going to, I'm going to run quickly through it because uh, of the time that we have. My name is Tete Baloi. I'm the communications officer at Safost. I hold an honors degree in communications. I've worked in various industries, but I've worked extensively in the health industry and mostly for, for NGOs. So today we spoke about getting job ready, knowing what the employer is looking for in you. We spoke about the importance of volunteering and we spoke mainly also about getting your CV ready so that it opens the door for you. So now we're going to talk about one aspect that's always tricky one when you go to the job interviews. We land the interviews, but we not get the job. And it's not mainly because you are not qualified or you're not a good person or anything. Sometimes we miss certain subtle non-verbal communication cues that we miss during interviews and they cost us the job. So communications is defined in many ways. There's a million definitions of communications. Uh, there's your standard definition which says communication is your exchange of meaning and words. You can find that on the internet is the first one that pops up, but there's various that talks about culture and how it influences our communications, the symbols, the images, which formulate these meanings, the habitual components that forms our stories. And then sometimes when not presented very well, they can hamper our communications with the interviewers. So you need to look at communications as something that goes beyond the words that we present but how we speak those words your pitch your accent your tone some of these things are associated with knowledge if you don't speak clearly if you speak very low we might think that you're not confident because you don't really know what you're talking about so as those things that hamper our process of landing that job during interviews so let's look at the meta functions of communications. It can either reinforce your verbal message, so it adds emphasis. It can complement your verbal message. It can sometimes contradict your verbal message. It may replace a verbal message. Sometimes it can even regulate the flow of verbal interaction. So what we mean when you're saying contradict, somebody can say that they're happy, but their face says they're sad. Sometimes, if you ask me a question, I can just give you a sign that I'm not feeling okay or I'm feeling okay. So we already know in South Africa, we have the sharp, sharp finger that says I'm fine. So we're going to talk about the uh, channels of nonverbal communications, which are the body, your face, your eyes, the use of space, artifactual, touch, paralanguage, time, and smell. So body movements as referred to as kinetics, your body positioning, your facial expressions, they tell us how you feel, they represent who you are. If a person is bossy looking at the image that's on your screen now, a person can show you that they're establishing dominance by standing in a certain way, and others can show you that I'm not inviting in the way that I present myself by just talking to you, leaning back with my arms fold, folded behind me. So sometimes we use illustrators to reinforce the messages that we're making. And the body posture sometimes tells you, uh, tells the employer the kind of person that you are. You don't want to be slouching on, on the couch when you're being interviewed or on the chair. And how we appear, uh, the, the way your body appears when you go to, to job interviews, they represent a certain thing. You don't need to go there exposing all your body art, dressed as if you're going to a rock concert meanwhile you're trying to land the job facial communication as it communicates emotions but sometimes facial communications tells people that you're trustworthy the meaning behind trustworthy when you speaking to your interviewer try to engage them by looking them in the eye if there's various interviewers when one asks you a question, pay attention to them by turning your face towards them so that they know that you're listening to them and respond to them. And when you respond to that interviewer, please also take a second to direct your face towards the other interviewers so that they still feel continue to be engaged in the interview. So this is a clear example of what uh, fish what I was talking about. So when you even 
doing the handshake during the interview, keep your faces locked so that the person sees that you looking directly at them and you are not presenting yourself as a shady character. So artifactual communications, this as some things that we use to project identity. They define the setting and personal territories we personalize the environments with, and they project professional identity. So when you go to an art studio, you'd find that there's art on the wall. If you go to a, a person who owns maybe a record label, you find that there's the records on the wall. So when you go to, to the job interview for the food industry, you should know what certain things communicate. If you're going there for a certain position, you already know that this is the dress code. The office should be looking like this so that you can be familiar with the, with the settings around you. So your clothes, sometimes, like Marianne said, that sometimes, ladies, we want to present ourselves as fashion, fashion models. Sometimes you need to keep it simple. Look at the industry that you're applying a job into what kind of clothes they wear, so you can know how to, how to dress properly. For instance, when you go into the banking industry, they wear darker colors. In the law industry, they wear darker outfits, so it's always either a navy blue or dark blue suit or a black suit. So it's things like that that tells the imp potential employer that you understand the environment that you're about to, to spend your life in. The parallel language is how you, present your words, the voice, pitch, the rhythm, the tone. Like I said, sometimes when you when you use certain ways that you present your language, when you speak very low, people assume that you do not really know what you're talking about. Time is very important. Be on time, if not early for the job interview. I always prefer that you be there 15 minutes prior to the job interview. It gives you time to compose yourself. It gives you time to relax your mind and be ready for the for the interview. If you're late for the interview, sometimes we know in South Africa the value of time, we even attach it to the economy and say time is money. So if you're late for the job interview, it might communicate to the potential employer that you will always be late for your job. Another important thing is how we smell. Sometimes perfume is great, but too much perfume is also not great. So we need to understand that when you go into that job interview, you're going to be in somebody else's office. They don't want, need to smell you until they sneeze to feel your presence in the room. But it's always a good thing that you smell very nice. You presented very neatly to the potential interviewer. The one nonverbal mistake that people should avoid doing is the unusual handshake. Guys, we have that special handshake that we have as friends that we do when we meet each other on campus, that we do when we meet each other on the streets, but that's not the proper handshake. So we need to have the proper handshake that's very formal. You need a firm hand, not too tight and not too soft. It shows that you're a person that knows how to handle themselves and you have the confidence to meet people that, are, that may be superior to you and that you are confident enough to be a person in a job. So one thing that you need to also avoid, poor eye contact. Sometimes when you're looking down, people are not sure if you're, not, if you're interested in them or interested in what they're saying. It shows that sometimes you lose attention quickly. And too much eye contact to most people in different cultures, it may be intimidating. So we need to limit it. Try to engage the person, but do not stay in their eyes for a very long time without even blinking. Too much gestures during the interview, it shows that you're nervous, shaking of legs, exaggeration of hand gestures, it's not presenting you very well during the interview. Lack of facial expressions. If you say I'm excited, it would be an exciting opportunity for me to work for your organization. The face to, needs to also complement that message. If you say I'm, going, I'm very excited and your face says that you said, it tells the interviewer that your messages are contradicting. You might be saying that you're excited to join them, but in actuality, you're not. Then they might opt to give your position to somebody else. Bad body posture, these things, that the way that we sit, when we're sitting, 
talking to somebody in the office is not the same way that we sit when we're at home relaxing and watching tv you need to watch your body chester you do not need to lean back do not slouch do not cross your legs and fold your arms during an interview sometimes people see it as a way of disrespecting them do not wear inappropriate attire for an example in the picture you we see that gentleman there the jacket is way too loose the shirt is undone he has sunglasses on the top of his head he's not wearing a tie that tells a different message to the interviewer it tells them that you do you are not a formal person perhaps you do not even own a suit you went to borrow your dad's suit you're not well groomed you're not well mannered and ladies when you wear your dresses it shouldn't be too revealing you're there to present yourself as a professional person and you're not modeling the dress to them we've already spoke about body odor and that brings me to the end of my presentation guys i uh, want to take this time to formally thank all the speakers for for being here today and i would like to thank you all for attending before i take any questions because after the questions we'll just quickly close the webinar because i think we might be over time with four minutes so remember there's the virtual congress that's happening and you can still register we do have the one day registration fee that people can use it's cheaper you can attend one day of the congress you can look at the program and see the topics that are interesting to you and register specifically for that day and be part of the Southwest Congress experience. It's cheaper this year because it's online and you can access it from the comfort of your home or your residence at, at the university. Thank you very much, Irene. If there are any questions. Um, thank you so much, Atsetse. Um, uh, at the moment, there's no questions, but I think your presentation is brilliant. And it's not just good for going for an interview, I think then, from a day to day, um, going to work and you interact with people. Um, we can all use um, this example or these examples that you've mentioned. Um, and we can use it every day. Um, I must say, I, even I have learned a lot. Um, thank you so much, Setsi. Um, and everybody, there's no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you.